In this exercise, we're going to see how it is that the seemingly magical looking new salt correlations actually come into being. We're not going to solve any equations to come up with a correlation. We're going to pretend solve some equations and get the form of what the equations should look like. So hopefully this is enlightening and lets you know that it's not just experimental magic that uh, gives us our new salt relations. So this is called the boundary layer exercise. So the boundary layer equations themselves are basically the conservation of mass, the conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy applied to an infinitesimally small point inside the boundary layer. That should remind you of something, right? What does it remind you of? I'm hoping it reminds you of the conduction equation, right? The conduction equation is also conservation of something applied to an infinitesimally small spot. In the case of convection, of course, we have a moving fluid, so we need multiple equations. We can't get away with just energy. We need mass, we need momentum, and we need energy as well. And we have to take into account that the fluid is moving. These are the assumptions that go into the boundary layer equations. They're essentially the same uh, assumptions that it lets you talk about a boundary layer. First off, we're looking at only incompressible flow. We're looking at only steady flow. We're going to say there are no pressure variations in the direction perpendicular to our plate in a boundary layer. We're going to say viscosity is constant. And finally, we're going to say that viscous shear stresses in the y direction, that is normal to the plate, are negligible. Okay, so we're not going to derive the boundary layers, but I'm just going to give you a taste of where these equations come from. So here is my infinitesimally tiny little slice of fluid in my boundary layer, and I've blown it up here so you can see arrows coming in and out. If you were to apply conservation of mass to this, from con out, you think about here's some m dot coming in and m dot leaving over there, m dot at x, m dot at x plus delta x. Same thing with some stuff coming in the bottom and the top. So an m dot coming in on surface uh, y and then leaving it y plus dy. These mass flow rates might be different than each other because the velocities might be different. So let's just leave it to say that if you incorporate these velocities, u for the x direction velocity, v for the y direction velocity, take into account they might be different in and out of the box and throw in rho and throw in uh, cross-sectional area and you manipulate it, eventually you get this equation right here. So this is essentially the infinitesimally small version of conservation of mass. m dot n is equal to m dot out for our little box, assuming that we have an incompressible fluid. It doesn't look like m dot n is equal to m dot out, but it is. So that's called the continuity equation, so-called because density is assumed to have a value at a point, hence the fluid is continuous. So if you do the same thing and you look at uh, momentum instead, you see the picture gets very complicated very quickly. So here's a velocity coming in and there's an m dot v term associated with that. And there's a velocity leaving over here. There's an m dot v associated with that, also in the y direction. And now you get to take into account forces, which include pressure right? And also shear stress, tau, which depends on viscosity. So all of these arrows are, um, they've got a lot of baggage, let's say, okay? So I'm not going to drag you through the derivation of this. You could do it, but suffice it to say that if that's your system and you apply conservation of momentum in the x direction, this is what you get. That's called the momentum boundary layer equation. Those terms right there, those are the m dot v terms, the ones that have u du dx and v du dy. This guy and this guy, both of these come from the sum of the forces acting on the thing, which include both pressure forces and viscous forces. And then last and certainly not least, we have the boundary layer equation that comes from conservation of energy. So again, I'm not going to drag you through it, but suffice it to say that those terms, u dt dx, come from m dot h, enthalpy terms. And this term, hopefully you can guess it. Do you remember what alpha is? It's k over rho times c. That's right. So k is in there, and there's a derivative of temperature. This comes from energy uh, from conduction in the y direction inside my little element. Okay, so with no real derivation, here are the equivalent of the conduction equation for a boundary layer for a mass, x momentum, and energy as well. 
let's keep in mind that my boundary layer is some thickness dv, and that might change in the x direction. So here's where scale analysis comes in. If you want to know the friction factor or the skin friction coefficient, you actually have to solve those equations uh, legitimately. That's really hard. If you do it exactly, you can only do it in some cases. You can approximate it by assuming a solution and uh, putting in, for instance, a velocity that changes as a straight line. You did some of that in fluids. But I want to show you a shortcut, which I like quite a bit. It's called scale analysis. And it allows us to get an order of magnitude uh, for what these variables are without having to solve anything, right? So if you don't know how to solve differential equations, and I count myself as one of those people, at least not very well, certainly not a bunch of them, this scale analysis is a lot of bang for the buck. So here's the way it works. The principle is this. When you have an equation, all right, and you have u show up in it, velocity in the x direction, or you have the variable x, the x coordinate, what you do is you replace those variables with a typical value or a constant for your particular case. And all of your equal signs turn into squiggles, all right? Which means it's no longer equal, things are on the order of. That's scale analysis. It's pretty powerful and it can get us uh, pretty far with very little effort. So let's do that for the skin friction coefficient. The skin friction coefficient is defined as the shear stress at the wall divided by one half rho u infinity squared. That's equation one. Let's play with scale analysis. First off, what is the shear stress at a wall for a viscous fluid? Yeah, you remember this, it is mu du dy evaluated at the wall where y is equal to zero. Okay, now let's do the scale analysis. I'm not going to solve it. I'm going to get rid of this equals and put a squiggle in its place. And where I see numbers here, I'm going to replace them with typical values of those. Okay, so to do this, Let's look at the picture. This is previous in your notes. Let's look at the picture. Here's my boundary layer. Here's the X direction. Here's the Y direction. Mu is mu. I leave that alone. U, the X direction velocity. What is a typical value of the X direction velocity? U infinity. What is a typical value of Y? Well, it's not the length of the plate. That might be a typical X value. A typical Y value? That's the boundary layer thickness, right? So scaling tau is equal to mu du dy, y is equal to zero, looks like this. Tau at the wall scales with mu times u infinity over boundary layer thickness, okay? This will not give you a right number, but if you plug in numbers here and it says that your shear stress is 0.08, you can bet that your shear stress is probably going to be 0.08 plus or minus, you know, maybe even 100%, right? You might get 1.6, you might get 0.4, right? But you're not going to get 20, you're not going to get 100, you're not going to get 1 times 10 to the negative 6. It scales with this in order of magnitude analysis. We're not done, are we? Because you're looking at this and going, well, that's great. I don't have any clue what the boundary layer thickness is. I don't have an estimate for that. I don't have a number. I can have a plate that's 1 meter long and I know L. I don't know what boundary layer thickness is. We're going to come back to that. Let's call this equation two. So to get that boundary layer thickness, we're going to scale the boundary layer equations themselves. We're going to start with the easy one, continuity, conservation of mass, which is du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. Let's scale it. Typical value of u, u infinity. Typical value of x, l. Typical value of v, I don't know. Right? I don't know a typical value in the y direction, so I'll leave that alone. Typical value of y, boundary layer thickness. So scaled, this looks like u infinity over l squiggles with v over dv. The useful part of continuity is this. dv over l times u infinity is the order of magnitude of my y direction velocity. So conservation of mass scaled gave me a useful result. I still don't know what dv is, but at least I know that v scales with the ratio of dv and l and u infinity. So let's keep going. 
call that equation three? And let's move on to the x direction momentum boundary layer equation. This is what we started with. So first off, if we're looking for flow over a flat plate, dp dx out here outside the boundary layer is zero because velocity doesn't change. It has to have the same gradient inside the boundary layer. So for at least for a flat plate, that term goes away. I'm now going to scale all these guys. u, u infinity. That du, u infinity. That x, l. v, I'm going to use the result from continuity. That u, u infinity. That y, d, v, etc. So you're getting the hang of this, right? So this equation is further going to scale pretty quickly. Notice I made a little substitution here. That mu over rho, that is nu, right? The kinematic viscosity. Don't confuse it with the y direction velocity. Okay, so scaling it just the way we talked about. U infinity, U infinity, L. V, U infinity, dV. Nu, U infinity here, dV squared on the bottom. This V I get from continuity. So substituting the result from continuity, I'll do it in red so you can see it, U over L times dV, uh-huh, and that dV constants are that dV, it looks like these two terms are in the same order of magnitude, U squared over L for both, and the right-hand side is left alone. Hey, you know what I can do now? I can solve this equation. You can't, be see, can't see me doing this. I'm actually making finger quotes here because it's not really an equation, it's a squiggle equation. But I can solve this equation for dV, and this is what I get. dV is LV over U squared, or dV squared is that. Take square root, your boundary layer thickness is going to scale with L times kinematic viscosity over U infinity to one half power. Let's put it in dimensionless form the way fluid mechanicians love to do and look at delta V over L. And when you do this, you recognize something there? This is nu over U infinity L to the one half. Stand on your head or turn your computer screen upside down and look at it. That is one over Reynolds number to the one half power, all right? We've done it. We now know how boundary layer thicknesses scale with Reynolds number. Again, this will not give you an accurate number, but it'll get you the right order of magnitude. If you want a number, what you can do is say that D over or dV over L is some constant over Reynolds number squared, where this constant has to be solved for either by solving the equations for reals, making assumptions about how to solve those equations, or running experiments. This is why I love scale analysis. It got us this far. This is pretty amazing, okay? So we labeled dV, that equation four, labeled this equation dimensionless form number five. Okay, I'm gonna pick up the pace from now because we're basically done. You see the idea and we kind of wanna move forward and get the results. So let us take equation four and plug it into equation two, which is the equation for shear stress in squiggle form. So I've made the substitution there in red. So tau w squiggles with mu u infinity, and here is my boundary layer thickness that I got from my previous analysis. So it's no longer mu u infinity over dv. dv is now replaced with all of that stuff. I can do a little bit of algebra on that, and then I can take that result and put it back into equation one, which was the one for the skin friction coefficient. So once again, I'm making the substitution in red. So my tau is equal to all of that stuff on the right-hand side of this equation right here. That's what's in red. And then divide that sucker by one half rho v, I'm sorry, rho u squared, okay? And when you do that, okay? And by the way, I've gotten rid of my two because hey, things that are on the order of one, they go away in squiggle land. All right, so I do a little bit of algebra on this and it doesn't take you too long to see that once again, I get something I recognize in terms of Reynolds number, nu over UL to the one half power or one over Reynolds number to the one half power. So my friction factor, if I want an actual number, I have to put constant over Reynolds number to the one half. And there you have it. 
So if you go back and you look at your fluids textbooks for friction factor correlations for laminar flow over flat plates, you're going to see they all look like this, right? And we found out why without having to solve the equations, okay? So I'm going to say it once again. We can't figure out what that constant is from scale analysis, but I can be darn sure that if I have Reynolds number, then it's 1, right, that my CF is going to be on the order of 1 over 1 or 1. It ain't going to be 100. It ain't going to be 0 0.001. Very good. Okay, so you can play this same game with the boundary layer equation for conservation of energy. And what you're going to get out of this is new salt number, what it scales with. So we have to be careful here, though, right? So it's not exactly the same scaling that we've done before. Here are some of the differences. First off, you would have to think about what your temperature scale is. You probably shouldn't use just one temperature. These are all DTs, right, delta Ts. I would probably use T surface minus T infinity is a typical value of a DT, right? And the other thing that you've got to be careful with is U. So you might go U scales with U infinity. Uh, probably not, okay? So you actually have to modify this and multiply it by DT over DV. Why? Because this boundary layer equation is for energy. It applies within the thermal boundary layer, right? DT. And at least if we have a Prandtl number that's greater than one, we know that thermal boundary layer is all contained inside the velocity boundary layer. So a typical velocity down here is going to be a fraction of U infinity, specifically the fraction dt over dv. If you were going to look at scale analysis for a Prandtl number less than one, then you could use U infinity as before. But Prandtl number changes your velocity scale here. Okay. So I'm going to leave this as an exercise to you, right? So play around with the scale analysis. Put TS minus T infinity in there. Put this for you here. Do your continuity. Figure out what V is, blah, 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 blah. Eventually, you'll get there. And here's what you're going to get. You're going to get new salt scales with Reynolds number to the 1 half, Prandtl number to the 1 third. Or if you want an actual number, constant times Reynolds number to the 1 half, Prandtl number to the 1 third. And this constant comes from the real solving of the equations or, again, experiment. And again, if you look in your uh, textbook for correlations for Neusselt number across a flat plate, at least for laminar flow, all right, then you're going to get correlations that look just like this. What do you do with turbulent flow? Okay, well, the boundary layer equations for turbulent flow look different because of all the swirly, mixy things going on. You get things called turbulent shear stress and fancy things like that. Um, so you can actually do that, but it becomes a lot more complicated and you need a little bit of turbulence theory to get you there.